So um, before we go any further, let me acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land from where I speak, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung and Bunurong people of the East Kulin Nations. I also pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We extend that, that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, especially if you're joining us today. We acknowledge their living connection to country, relationship with the land, um, and all things, all living things extending back tens of thousands of years. So today we will have a panel discussion with a very impressive and accomplished panel, followed by an open Q&A session. Um, you can also put in your questions or comments in the chat and we can discuss them through the session or um, in the Q&A at the end. So um, I just want to say that I'm kind of blown away by the sheer number of people that we have on right now. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and yes, let's just, you know, uh, let's just move to our topic, which is digital methods. Um, even before the pandemic, internet scholars have been innovating and adapting different approaches to digital fieldwork in response to the ongoing creation and evolution of internet platforms, technologies, and practices. Digital methods are gaining popularity and a lot of salience in interdisciplinary academic research. So through today's session, we're aiming to throw some light on some of the advantages and challenges faced by researchers seeking to use digital methods in varying ways. So to help us unpack um, all things digital methods in quotes, we have three wonderful panelists. Dr. Brady Robarts is a senior lecturer in sociology at Monash University in the School of Social Sciences. His research explores how young people use and produce digital social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, Snapchat, and Reddit. Uh, Brady is also a co-convener of the Monash Digital Cultures Research Group. So maybe we can speak about that as well, uh, Brady, a little, in a little while. Next, we have Simon Copland, who is a PhD candidate in sociology at the Australian National University. And we've just heard that he's submitted. So yay, Simon. Um, Simon's studying the online manosphere on Reddit. Um, his research interests focus on online misogyny, extremism, and male violence, um, as well as the politics of digital platforms and Reddit specifically. Our third panelist is Dr. Claire Sabaton, a lecturer in digital technology and pedagogy in the School of Education at La Trobe University. Her research explores how social media platforms and other digital technologies are used for learning and sharing knowledge. And her previous work has explored digital youth cultures, surveillance and privacy, uh, digital health and sexuality. So um, welcome to our panelists. Thank you for being here. And without further ado, let's jump right in. So if I may, would the three of you start off start us off with like a quick description of your work and your research interests, and more specifically, how you incorporate or center digital methods in your research. Um, how about we start with you, Simon? Okay, hello. I was worried you were gonna start with me, um, <laughs> but that's fine. It just means I can get going. Hi, everybody, uh, and uh, thank you for coming. It is a great, a great turnout for this event, and I think it should have shows the uh, excitement and energy that people have around um, digital methods. Um, as Richard said, I am uh, just finished my PhD uh, at the uh, School of Sociology at the ANU. I submitted a week and a half ago. I'm still kind of on the high from that. So I'm sure I'll have some sort of crash coming up soon uh, when I realise it's all done. Um, my research looks at the online manosphere, which is a collection of um, blogs, forums, social media platforms, uh, dedicated to quote unquote men's interests uh, and life philosophies for men, um, but it has a very strong uh, anti-feminist and misogynist um, uh, basis within it. Uh, so there's a range of different uh, groups that, that exist primarily online um, that uh, form the manosphere. So the, the most famous one is um, incels. Um, so these are involuntary celibates, men who um, believe that they've been denied, again in quotes, uh, sexual relationships from women, uh, and with, there's been a number of uh, incels who've undertaken violent attacks, so um, particularly terrorist attacks in Canada and the US. Uh, then there's uh, pickup artists who, who use techniques to uh, called game to go and uh, learn how to pick up women, uh, and then another group called men going their own way who believe that relationships with women are so toxic that they need to uh, distance themselves from them entirely and even distance themselves themselves from society entirely because society is so bad for men. 
Um, so my research was really focused on understanding the development of this community, this community, the broader community called the Manosphere, understanding why men go to these places. Uh, and what they get out of them, um, and in turn, thinking about ways that we can we can deal with the misogyny that comes from it. Um, and because they're an online, they're primarily an online space. The, I, I had to naturally turn to uh, digital methods to, to to really study them. And I, I, I coming into my PhD, I wouldn't have considered myself a, a digital scholar, um, but interested in this community, I, I really had to learn and adapt and figure out. Um, about digital methods to to be able to really properly study this community, and it's and it's been quite a wild ride, um, but one that I, I don't regret in many in in any way um, because it was it was so fascinating to learn all these different methods. Um, so I turned um, primarily to Reddit, uh, which is um, one of the sort of largest social media platforms, um, but also one of the largest platforms where these three communities that I'm talking about sort of all came together and met and discussed and chatted. Uh, and there was just a heap amount of content there. There's lots of different spaces where they meet, but this one, Reddit was a perfect one where they were all together and there was data that was really easily available. Uh, and using um, some coding tools and a, and a website called bushshift.io, which um, uploads all of Reddit's data as a guy out of the US who does that. I downloaded um, 14 months worth of Reddit data for three subreddits. So it, it equal to about uh, um, 180,000 um, posts, initial posts and 3.8 million comments from that. Uh, a huge data set, like a really, really big data set. It, uh, analyzing it has been a real challenge. Uh, and um, uh, because it's because of its size and I, I would have loved to have collected all of the data from all three of the subreddits I was interested in, but it was just far too big. We decided, my supervisor decided I just couldn't do it. It would crash my computer consistently and it would just not be feasible. Um, but yeah, so there's so that's what I did. This was my data set, and what I what I did was a range of different techniques to really go into this really big data set. Uh, and I'll go through um, a few of those, and then we can talk about um, about what they uh, talk about some more of the nuances in the in the discussion. Um, so I did a thing called topic modeling, which is running using um, computer learning technique uh, to uh, go over all of the text. Uh, in a really iterative process, the uh, the process oh, took, took about um, five days on my computer to just be constantly processing. There was just a constant running of a program to make this happen. But what it does is it spits out a range of topics. Um, so gives you word profiles of common, common things that are commonly discussed that you can then analyze to understand what are the broader topics that are being discussed in this in the in the data set. And that then becomes uh, that then. Um, you can then analyze that and I turned them into themes, which really gave me a sense of the broader um, discussion points. What are the main areas that they're talking about? So how can you take something really big, a really big data set and figure out what are the key, key points of discussion? And so I discover, discovered that there was a lot of discussion, this is not surprising, about sex and relationships. There was a lot of discussion about gender politics. There was a race, a, a topic of race, a lot of so racial politics. Um, so there was a, lots of things, but it gave me an overview of the data that I could then go into in more depth. Um, I did another thing called network analysis, social network analysis, which was looking at how individuals connected together. So looking in Reddit, if someone posted something and then someone replied to that post, I would, that would create a link between them and looking at how people are forming community in these subreddits and, and using that as a way to understand how community is structured. Uh, and that was particularly relevant because in this community, I found that belonging or a sense of belonging was really important to these men uh, and feeling like they were belonging in these communities was really important to them. And then I found that the, the structures of the platform didn't really allow for this kind of in-depth belonging that they were seeking, seeking a lot um, and that they had a really shallow kind of communities that were very broad and, um, and that social network analysis created some really beautiful maps that I could use and that, uh, that were really nice, but it also showed some real in-depth analysis. Uh, and then I mixed those kind of big, sort of big data techniques with a real quality of in-depth reading of posts. So I took the topic models, I identified um, what were the big discussion points, and then I looked through the data and found uh, examples of these, in-depth examples. And in the Manosphere, what's quite interesting is you have people who will post often very long posts, uh, very long, very emotional, very in-depth posts. Um, and so I would pick some of the, the most prominent of these um, primarily looking at you know what has the most comments or what has the most the highest score in Reddit you can vote on posts. Uh, looking at that, reading it, and then reading all of the comments as well to really understand discussion. So picking examples um, from my 
big data set and coming down and really looking at it in, in, um, in, a, in a real close textual analysis kind of a way and thinking about that in the context of the relationships that people might be developing or the topics that they're discussing, those kinds of things. So a mixed kind of a quantitative and qualitative approach to really understand these communities and my thesis has that. So it'll have the kind of big approach that then goes into an individual post, which I will spend pages and pages analyzing um, as an example of the topics and the discussions that I'm bringing out. Um, does that answer the first initial question? Oh, great. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's kind of an yeah, overview. Sure. I'll, let, I'll let the other two speak and then we can have some discussion about it. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Simon. Claire? Hello. Um, well, I would probably describe my kind of uh, digital methods approach as like a series of um, constant making mistakes, which I think is kind of how we learn about digital methods, because you're almost always using a method that maybe hasn't been used in the context that you're um, employing it. So um, I'm just constantly making mistakes that keep me up at night and haunt me for the rest of my life. So that's kind of um, a bit of a preamble to, to my story, but I might talk a little bit about the different kinds of methods that I've used. Um, I think I've, I've often kind of incorporated digital aspects into what you might consider more traditional qualitative research methods. So I've done things like, um, you know, something that's very common now, which is kind of doing qualitative interviews via kind of digital platforms. So, so what's often done now is kind of doing qualitative interviews over Zoom, but I've done things like doing interviews over kind of instant messaging platforms, which is sort of an asynchronous interviewing technique, which is really interesting. And I'm happy to talk about that um, if anyone has any questions. Um, and sort of incorporating digital elements into, into interviews. So things like getting participants to um, take screenshots, to um, take photos, and then kind of come into an interview with kind of digital artifacts that they then kind of discuss. So methods that kind of are digital, but sort of still incorporate many of those kind of traditional qualitative um, techniques that we're quite familiar with. Um, and then I've kind of, um, done a lot of sort of digital ethnography, kind of exploring platforms, exploring content with a more sort of sustained engagement on a, on a digital platform. So platforms like um, TikTok is a platform that I've spent a lot of time on, not just, you know, because I'm obsessed with TikTok, but also for research purposes. Um, so kind of thinking about how do we um, engage with platforms in a way that sort of um, not necessarily replicates, because I try and stay away from sort of more positivistic ideas about um, how to kind of conduct research, but how do we engage with a platform in a, with a platform in a way that is um, sort of has similar experiential qualities to how um, an everyday user might experience it? So I think digital ethnography has a lot of those um, qualities that allows us to kind of tap into the kind of sensory elements of a platform. Um, and I've also done a lot of kind of content analysis, so looking at platforms like YouTube. Um, and again, TikTok kind of analyzing content. Um, and my work has kind of looked at lots of different issues. So I've looked at kind of surveillance and privacy online fan communities, kind of how people access health information on different platforms. But I think the kind of thread that holds it all together is sort of an interest in um, emotions and affect and the kind of sensory elements of online spaces. Cause we often think that uh, there's kind of, I think, a, a conception of digital spaces as kind of being about, you know, that's where our brains live, but our bodies kind of don't have a, a place in these digital spaces. But I think a lot of these methods have a really good way of kind of connecting to the fact that digital worlds are really sensory, really emotional kind of spaces. So my work has always been interested in um, thinking about those, the kind of feelings um, and the emotions and the kind of sensations of digital spaces. So um, my methods have always been interested in um, really tapping into those kind of elements of digital spaces. Uh, and I think that's why potentially the methods have always been kind of, I often talk about them as really messy and, um, uh, you know, of, often making lots of mistakes. So I'm really happy to kind of talk about my um, constant mistakes and learning from those mistakes. Um, but that's kind of an overview of the sort of methods that I've used. Thanks, Claire. Um, Brady. Hey everyone, so nice to see people and thanks so much Richard for organising this too. Um, just to kind of riff off, yeah, Claire's points, I love that this idea of, you know, digital research methods are often about making mistakes and being messy and I think, you know, digital research methods, um, are, you know, we, we innovate and kind of develop methods through trying stuff out and through writing it down and, and other people building on it and I've I've really benefited from that um, over my career and the research that I've been doing. Um, 
And I think as much as the messiness and the kind of mistakes and that sort of stuff is great and productive, but it does also raise a bunch of questions for us about ethics and how we do things and what we can borrow from other, you know, more traditional methods and bring into digital methods. And I'm thinking about Laura's question in the chat um, about ethics that we can come back to, and maybe I'll talk a bit about this as well. Um, so my background is in the sociology of youth and digital media. So for the last 15 years or so, I've been studying how young people use social media, which has obviously changed a lot over the um, over that period of time. Um, I also have interests in gender and sexuality. So I've studied how young LGBTQ plus people in Australia use social media. Um, I've studied different kinds of platforms and apps, including dating apps and, and a whole range of different digital cultures. So that's sort of my background. Um, in terms of the projects that I've been working on, I've worked on a number of different projects that employ different methods that um, can be more on the digital end or non-digital as well. And I kind of want to throw a few provocations out around what we mean by digital methods. So I'm actually going to share my screen if that's okay. I know we weren't supposed to prepare a presentation, but um, this helps me talk to, you know, give a few visual examples to speak to. Um, so I guess one of the areas of digital methods work that I've been most um, involved with over the years is developing a method called the social media scrollback method. Um, and I developed this with a colleague of mine, Sean Lincoln, who's a, a researcher in the UK, to study how young people's um, social media use changed over time. So we used this method to scroll back with participants through their Facebook timelines. And we did this as a way to kind of prompt discussions, memory work, reflections that then kind of prompted longer kind of um, discussions about things that weren't necessarily on Facebook, but that, um, you know, were sort of implied or shadowed or semi-invisible. And since then, and obviously, you know, this kind of method, we didn't just like invent it out of thin air. This kind of method is informed by, you know, a, a long tradition on things like longitudinal research, visual methods, photo elicitation methods, ethnography more generally. So it's just kind of like an example of a kind of qualitative method where you work in interviews with participants to sort of co-analyze their own digital traces together. And since we did this um, project under the Facebook timelines category, a number of people have done so many, so much more interesting and exciting things with this kind of approach where you actually work with participants to scroll back through their histories together. And before we came along, there were people doing work like this in this sort of area, like I'm thinking about people like Amy Dobson, who did this work with MySpace profiles back when MySpace was a thing, um, people like Alice Marwick and Dana Boyd, who worked with their participants um, through their material. We just kind of gave it a name. And since then, it's kind of allowed a lot of other people to sort of build on it and attach new methods to it or apply the scroll back method in different contexts. So um, it's really kind of my background is more qualitative research methods. And that's kind of my entry point into this, how to work with people through their social media data. Um, but of course it does, you know, as, as Laura's question prompts us to think about, raise a bunch of questions around ethics. So, you know, friending research participants is part of the work that I've been doing. And what does that do in terms of making participants sort of digital histories visible to us? But on the flip side, um, you know, as a researcher and, you know, needing to protect my um, privacy and boundaries around my work, you know, what does this do when you're friending participants and giving them access to your private and personal spaces. Um, and then of course, in terms of scrolling back with people through their own social media histories, these are often constituted by posts made by others that they might be tagged in or they might you know, have commented in. And so their disclosures and their kind of visibility is part of this kind of scroll back method. So how we record that or you know, reflect on that is, is really an important issue for us as sociologists to kind of reflect on the ethics of these sorts of methods all the time. Some other projects that I've been involved with, um, the Scrolling Beyond Binaries project looked at um, social media use among LGBTQ plus young people. Um, and that was with a number of colleagues, including Tarzan members like Brendan Churchill, Paul Byron, Sun Vivian and Ben Hankel. Um, and that was a few years ago now. And we didn't really use any exciting, innovative digital methods, but we did use social media to recruit survey participants and, and interview participants. And we don't often think about this as a kind of digital method because it's you know a survey and interviews they're kind of straightforward but um i think it is worth us factoring in these kind of how these traditional methods are now 
used and circulated through digital media in, in new ways and what this raises questions about. For example, using social media to put a call for participants out or we might pay for a boosted post or ask people to share it in their networks. These start to creep into you know, questions and ethics around digital methods. So what are the ethics of paying a platform like Facebook um, you know, to circulate our messages on, on Instagram or on our other platforms? So you know, this is, I think, part of the, the conversation around digital methods, even those more traditional methods, um, how they circulate in digital spaces is something for us to consider. And then a couple of other projects, um, we took the scroll back method um, that I developed with Sean and, and, and applied it in some other projects. So some work that I did with Vic Health here in, in Victoria with Steve Roberts, Britt Ralph, um, Carla Elliott and some other colleagues looking at men's drinking cultures in Victoria. And we used the scroll back method to do some kind of um, elicitation work where we scrolled back with our participants in the study to images that they had posted or that they had been tagged in of drinking events. And we use these as prompts to ask participants to reflect on the context, you know, the people involved, the sort of drinking practices that were demonstrated and so on. Um, and we also in this kind of took the scroll back a bit further and actually asked our participants to take screenshots for us of particular moments that they were discussing. And this was, there was a lot of scaffolding around this in terms of informed consent and building rapport. Um, but of course, the challenges here around, you know, how you get someone to understand, um, you know, that this is a research context and how we anonymize those images when they're collected and when other people that aren't participating in the study are represented in those images raises a number of um, concerns that we had to sort of think through. And then finally, I'm not going to talk too much about the Reddit scraping stuff because obviously Simon's much more um, across this than I am, but in a very lo-fi qualitative kind of way, we collected a number of posts through a Google Chrome extension and API you know, connector that works within Google Chrome to export um, posts from Reddit into a spreadsheet that we then in a very low-tech way use to identify and code posts that we wanted to follow up for qualitative analysis. So um, as part of this project with Ben Lyle, Claire Moran, and Gemma Sharp, um, we looked at a subreddit called Data is Beautiful, and we looked at um, examples of what we called confessional data selfies, where people had posted um, sort of rep visual representations of self-tracking data, um, for example, like heartbeat or footsteps taken, um, or other kinds of ways that they had recorded aspects of themselves and then shared it to Reddit to a large kind of um, network public of strangers ostensibly. So we use this as a kind of method to collect um, a large set of data, a thousand posts that then we did qualitative analysis on. So, you know, there's sometimes, and I know Simon's hinted at this and maybe we can come back to it about um, the work involved in collecting this material and how you actually make sense of very large data sets, much larger than we worked with in terms of the thousand posts. But um, yeah, maybe we can come back to that. But anyway, I'll stop there. That's enough from me. Thanks, Brady. And, and, and thank you to the three of you. Those introductions have not just given us like a small glimpse into kind of the incredible work that you're doing, but also gives us a, sen a very neat sense of the kind of diversity in, in, of, you know, in digital methods, how, in terms of how you incorporate it or even center it around your work. And even just going over some of the some of the adaptations that you were talking about in terms of you know the topic modeling and asynchronous interviewing techniques and you know scroll back for you Brady it it really does speak to the kind of innovations that are currently in place and you know constantly sort of evolving um, with um, you know with, with like the more practices and the more proliferation there is in terms of uh, internet platforms, but also. Um, I'm just gonna, I, I, I've got so many interesting, in sense, you've spoken about so much, I've got so many questions and I'm wondering whether I should segue to ethics, but I'm gonna hold off on that uh, because we definitely talk about it. And I'm just thinking about how, in terms of all the methods that you got, that you were speaking about, there's a, there's a turn right now in empirical internet research towards sort of the, you know, towards big data and, and like the ability right now that we have to compute and analyze large volumes of data. But conversely, there's also a push towards what we call, you know, thick data and, you know, what it's considered, you know, meaningful uh, data collection and meaningful data analysis um, when it comes to analyzing smaller data sets. So 
I don't want to pit this as a quant versus qual or like what is a what is a method you know that is more meaningful but then I just wanted to understand where you position yourselves in this in this sort of not debate but yeah in where do you position yourselves when it comes to yeah, as internet scholars per se and yeah what what's your perspective on what is meaningful um digital methods so maybe we'll start with you Claire yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think um, what's probably more important might be the kind of questions you're trying to answer, because um, I always like, I mean, I, I always love like a, you know, which side you're on kind of um, debate because it's fun to pick sides. Um, but I, I think in this situation, there are some questions that are going to be much better answered by, by you know, a big a big data type analysis. Um, I'm, I don't do a lot of big data analysis myself. That's not a huge part of my, my research. Um, but I think there are certainly questions that are much better answered by being able to aggregate large amounts of data, but equally there are questions that are only going to be appropriately answered by um, looking at qualitative detail. Um, and, and especially you've got to think about, especially when you're planning a project, you know, what, what's the kind of, what are the questions I'm interested in answering? What kind of theoretical perspective am I using? Um, and it's at that, that, that stage of the project that I think you're going to um, be able to understand, you know, um, yeah, what, what, what are you interested in the richness of the data or the kind of breadth of the data? And I think um, you don't necessarily have to, you know, as we've seen from a lot of these projects that we've been talking about, like Simon's work, you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, only have one type of data. And a, and a lot of projects incorporate different types of data, but I think it's important to think about really, think really carefully about what the kind of questions you are that like that you're interested in. And even if those questions, you know, by the end of the project, you think actually they've shifted a little bit that I think that's, you know, perfectly understandable, but really thinking carefully about what the what the questions you're you're asking are and can they be answered by the kind of data that you're that you're getting. Yeah. Great. Yes. Simon. Yeah, I was just going to build off. I agree with everything Claire has just said. Um, including you know it's fun to take a side but I think in this one it doesn't have to be an either or um but I also just want to build off and say it doesn't also uh it can be both uh and you can have projects where you can have one data set and this is exactly what I did which you are anal analyzing both uh using big data tech uh, big data techniques uh, as well as in-depth qualitative readings now I couldn't go and do an in-depth qualitative reading of every post that I had in my data set it would have I would still be going, uh, doing my analysis and not, and you know, that would not be feasible, but you can use, and you can actually use big data techniques to figure out where you might head, you know, which direction you might head in and doing your readings of posts, for example, or doing in that stuff. I, I had also spoken about, uh, I know, you know, of colleagues who will do a big data analysis and then will do uh, participation or uh, observation of people who are participating in these spaces uh, and you know you can do things like that so you can mix these things together um, and they can and, it, and I think it's quite can be quite valuable um, to to do so um, because it gives you different ways to look at the same question and I was using the I was answering the same questions with both techniques but I had different ways to examine the same question uh, and that was really valuable for me um to, to be able to do that so I think that yeah sometimes it's really great to mix things up and to, to use multiple methods um for a bit for for your same data set and I, I, I you know I'd strongly encourage doing that if you can absolutely I think that middle ground is is trying to sort of blend both and and paying um heed to both sides is actually the most ideal situation I suppose and uh yeah being able to do that is more challenging than we than we think Brady, what about you? What's your perspective? Totally agree with everything Claire and Simon have said. The only thing I guess that I'd add is, um, especially for PhD students or anyone you know starting out a new project, um, obviously one of the challenges in doing the kind of large scale data collection that Simon's been talking about is basic skills. So you know, learning a programming language or understanding you know, what, what's involved in doing that or getting access to the software and training. And that can be a great opportunity for someone starting out to learn a new skill set. Um, you know, in terms of, I'm thinking about, you know, going for jobs post PhD, um, having some quantitative research method skills is so valuable. Having sat on a number of selection committees over the last few years, having people that can teach social research methods in a broad way is super valuable. So don't underestimate the um, opportunity to learn some new skills in the way that Simon has. Um, but then for those of us that are, you know, 
finding that really challenging, partnering with people who have the skills is super valuable. So even though I'm very much thinking of myself as a qualitative sociologist, I've often partnered with people with quantitative skills, with kind of quantitative analysis work, but also computational methods in terms of um, digital methods. So, you know, you don't have to learn at all, but it is a, a really interesting and valuable skill set to get outside of what your normal comfort zone is, I suppose. Great, yes. Um, in, in terms of that, like what, having used these digital methods in different ways, what would you think um, are some of the opportunities and, and you know, the advantages of using them? And also on the flip side, what do you think have been some of the losses or the limitations or challenges of using digital methods in your research? And um, we probably start with uh, Brady this time. Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, opportunities are, like there's this interesting work around, um, and I hate to even invoke it here, but like the Gamergate, you know, fiasco, um, cultural phenomenon. And there was some really interesting research where people were talking about how, and you know, Simon will be very familiar with the, the kind of nature of the nanosphere and kind of misogyny online and, um, you know, how it's horrible to encounter this, but also the way that it's mediated in digital spaces also makes it visible in ways that previously, of course, misogyny, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, these issues and attitudes have always existed, but the digital mediation of these messages can make them visible and traceable by researchers in new ways. So I think there's an interesting opportunity here in terms of the work that sociologists do to study how these discourses operate and ideologies operate in, in an organic way. And I don't like using that term too much, but you know, these are the, the work, for example, that Simon's doing and, and some of the work that Claire's been doing. These are kind of capturing messages and discourses from everyday users in a very organic way without the intervention of a researcher to ask questions or to circulate a survey and rely on sort of self-selection. So that sort of opportunity in terms of a social science approach is really valuable. But of course, barriers, it throws up a lot of ethics questions about consent, waiver of consent, you know, is it right? Is it okay to be using messages that people post on social media as part of our research and analysis? And I'd love to hear Claire and um, Simon Wayne on that too. And it's a really great area. So it is quite challenging. And, and the question in terms of ethics always has to be, you know, who benefits? What kind of value is the research serving? Is there a kind of contribution to knowledge that might outweigh the discomfort that those Redditors, for example, or those TikTokers might feel in having their material ostensibly pub published in a public included in our research? And that's that's quite challenging for us. Um, Claire. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a really good point. I think that ethics um, is a question that I get all the time. And I think that sometimes we want a simple answer, which is, you know, this at this point, something becomes public. And before this, this point, say, you know, this many likes or this many followers, then you, it's okay or it's not okay. And the unfortunate reality um, but is that there's no simple answer. And in many ways, I think that's what makes the internet so interesting is that something can be private and um, need to be protected from like outside views and still have thousands of views and you can and it can seem extremely public it can be accessible to you and still be um, extremely private because it belongs to a kind of a subculture or, or I mean that sounds like a very dated term but you know it belongs to a community that isn't expecting to be researched isn't expecting to be interrogated um, and that's a really complex thing to navigate and it's something that we as researchers need to be thinking about all the time. And it, our kind of ethics conventions, I think, are very, uh, really out of date in the sense that, really they, you things. know, they, like they often expect us to be able to anticipate risks in advance. Mm -hmm. When you're in the kind of digital field, the risks are always going to be changing, you know, something that seemed you know very low risk can change you know a community that you might be studying might suddenly become very high profile overnight you know and that might really change the dynamics of the of the risk landscape that you're looking at and it's something that really puts a lot of responsibility on you as a researcher to be evaluating the situation all the time and thinking about how can you serve the best interests of the community that that you're studying to make sure that you're being respectful and you're being thoughtful and it's something you know I've definitely made mistakes in this area and I think you know it's it's important to think about um you know what's the contribution that you're making 
that allows this knowledge to be like the, the even if you because there are always risks it allows the risks to be worthwhile um and it ensures that you're not doing um you know uh, like undue harm a really great point in terms of where as researchers we're always sort of um weighing trying to weigh the risks versus the benefits and 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 even though we there are so many um, narratives around it, we're trying so hard to kind of limit as much the risk that to the population. It's also as a researcher, I feel at some level there's there's this um, trying to understand what our contribution is, not just to you know the creation of knowledge, but also towards the population that we are studying. What is the benefit to that populace? So yeah, and that's something that you know needs to be, needs to be teased out on a completely different level when it comes to um, you know digital methods and digital research. Um, what about you, Simon? Well, I, th I think that's interesting uh, that Claire has raised that, and I think it's a it's a really good point. But I think that there's I mean, from my perspective, um, one of the other ethical challenges is, the, is what is the risk to other populations um, who are being targeted by the groups that you're researching? Um, and so um, I, you know, I, in my thesis, for example, do um, uh, replicate, do copy, you know, do have um, uh, posts. Uh, I, I de I, I, I've anonymized, I, I take away people's username, so it doesn't say who their username is, but I do put in the to the text of the post to, to do deep analysis of it. Um, and part of that is a recognition that I think a lot of, in terms of risk to the populace that I'm researching, you know, I think a lot of them, uh, and I think that there is an active discussion there about wanting this to be public and wanting it to be dis to just dis be discussed. And so I think there's a less of a risk of bringing something that's intended to be private out into the public space. And, and that would be different for different groups. Some people want to be online for different for private spaces. Some people go online because they want to be publicized. They want to be, pub you know, they want to be out there. Uh, and I see this in, in the groups that I research are kind of they kind of relish being researched often and relish being discussed. Um, but that then brings its own risks. Um, like how do you do that in a way that doesn't give them extra voice that, or doesn't give their misogynistic views extra voice that they don't, that you don't want them to have? And how do you do it in a sensitive way to ensure that you're not just um, uh, publicizing stuff all the time? Um, and I and I had thought, you know, it would be really easy for me, for example, and I see people online do this, you know, in my own Twitter account, for example, um, and I see some people do it is online to post every day about the things that I've seen on Reddit and to share them and to to look about how awful it is. And, I've, and I, I have, you know, the part of me that wants to build my own profile thinks that would be a great thing to do. Um, but the but but the benefit there's no benefit of, of that except to, to to for me getting more followers. The benefit is actually to those groups. It's actually to and that the harm would be to them getting more. Um, shares and more, more, you know, building their profile. And so you've got these kind of other risks that can come out from this about thinking about the impacts that some of these communities have on other spaces um, or other, other groups or other communities or other peoples. Um, and so that's one thing that I'm kind of constantly thinking about is how do you write sensitively and study sensitively in that kind of way? Um, the other thing I'd say is, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits to that Brody has kind of spoken about, about um, that come from digital methods you know you just have access to a huge amount of data constantly that is just constantly being produced it's always there uh you can there's always something changing there's always something coming up every now and then i haven't done this for a while but there'd be some sort of uh uh thing that would appear on twitter some sort of campaign and i would suddenly be able to quickly go and download you know thousands of data you know thousands you know thousands of tweets associated with a hashtag that's disappeared by the next week but you have i have it sitting there you know if you one day you want to do that analysis there's always new projects that you could do um, I do think I miss the, uh, however, that I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to really be like uh, the, that, you know, that there's something uh, real about people, you know, there's something people, you know, in this context, to, you know, when you're talking to them face to face, that's the real them and that's, there's Twitter's not the real them, but, you know, that you do miss another side of the person by not being able to actually interact with them uh, and into and understand and talk to them about what they're doing. Um, and particularly, and one of the things I would say is we as researchers, one of the difficult things is we also have to be aware of the political economy of the platforms and how that influences what we're seeing and what we're analyzing and what gets publicized and what gets out there 
um, because it influences how these communities are work and all the content that is being, you know, that appears in people tops of people's feeds. Um, it really does influence that. And you have to, I think, have an understanding of the political economy of the platform you're researching to, to understand how these things operate and how these communities are developing, but also how it might be influencing you and how it might be influencing what you're seeing and what you're, what's appearing at the top of your feed. And so therefore the data that you're researching uh, and the way that people might interact because there are companies behind all of these platforms that are trying to make money and they have developed architectures for the platforms in a way that are designed to make money. Uh, they have algorithms that are designed to help them make money. And we need to understand, try and understand those things as much as possible because they influence our research, both in terms of how these communities operate and how these people talk, but also how we might be seeing things. Great. And, and, and very quickly before I open this up um, to, to everyone who's listening in the chat as well, Building off of what you said, Simon, and even especially with your work when uh, with digital ethnography, I I wonder how you feel about you know as internet scholars, as you know researchers or you know off the internet, how the kind of challenges that you face when it comes to blurring of the boundaries in terms of you know you spoke about you know being exposed for such a long time to you know the manosphere, a lot of the narratives that you don't necessarily agree with and as a digital ethnographer yourself Claire um, how it feels when it comes to sort of trying to find that boundary between what's personal and what's what's public what's work and versus versus you know what's what's again what's private um, how do you deal with that or how do you negotiate that that space um, I'll start with you this time Claire yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, it's important that we do interrogate this and, and kind of be a little bit um, reflexive about it in our work. So thinking about, um, like I think Simon's point about platforms having kind of algorithms that are going to curate content for you and kind of thinking about how your positionality in relation to the kind of content you're going to be exposed to, um, especially in projects like digital ethnography is really important. Um, but I think there's something that's, that's interesting about doing that kind of reflexivity in a digital ethnography project or any kind of digital research is I think we should also be doing it in any kind of non-digital, um, you know, research project. Like the, there's no, um, there's also blurring of boundaries when you're a researcher in any context. So you're always going to have a, a kind of um, entanglement in the, in the world. You're always going to have kind of personal histories that make your positionality important. And so I think it's the same kind of process we should be going through in any kind of, um, any research projects to think about how our positionality affects our interactions with our participants, our experiences. And so it's sort of a similar process of thinking about who am I and how might my encounter with this platform be shaped by my experiences. Um, and I think that that's uh, a process that we should go through in all of our, all of our research practice. And so digital um, researchers are not immune from this, but we're also not, um, I think, especially um, sort of biased by our kind of in our digital experiences. And I think that's, that's kind of the way I see it. It's just, it's just another kind of form of reflexivity that we engage with because we are researchers who live in the world. Absolutely. What about you, Brady? How, how do you feel about, um, you know, sort of blurring boundaries between someone who uses social media as, you know, as a, for, for leisure or pleasure or whatever, and then also having to do work on it? Yeah, it's interesting. I think when I was doing my PhD, I had like a, um, you know, a rule or a protocol around, because um, I, I friend my participants on, on social media, so following them and allowing them to follow me back. But when I have when it was Facebook based, I had a sort of separate setting so they could only see a certain number of posts and not posts that I was tagged and things like that. But then in hindsight, I've kind of reflected on limiting what they can see of me is an interesting kind of like researcher professional identity boundary thing. Um, and I don't know whether I would do it the same again. So, but I think it's different for different people, right? Like. I have never been harassed or stalked, um, whereas I know colleagues of mine, especially young women, um, have to think about this constantly in terms of what their public social media presence is. So I have particular kinds of privileges as a male researcher um, that I don't have to worry as much. There are some situations where it's possible, but that's a particular kind of privilege that I have. So I think it's different for different people. And I think that boundary work will vary from platform to platform, how you use social media and your kind of position and risks as well yeah but it's a tricky one but i agree with everything i said as well simon um i don't know if i have much more to add than what claire and brady have already said so i'd be quite happy to 
to skip on this one and, and move on to the next to the to the audience questions if that's all right i'm just trying to think Absolutely. but I, maybe something else will come when, I, when we're talking in the other questions for sure and we can just organically um put it in so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna open the discussion up to everyone so feel free to you know signal and like um and just speak or you can just contribute to the discussion that's already there on on chat and i'm just gonna um uh, there's this interesting um, question there about sort of um, recruiting through digital methods and in terms of um, the kind of voices and whether we think about the kind of voices that are privileged um, when we recruit through digital methods and you know whose voices are then being left out of our spaces and studies and and, and I wonder if anybody wants to take this question. I was just by you guys, right? Well, um, I think, yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. Um, and I think in terms of um, recruiting on in digital spaces, it's always important to think about, like, I mean, firstly, of course, who are the people that you're trying to recruit? And is the platform that you're choosing appropriate? Because um, sometimes, like, you know, I've when I was trying to recruit like a particularly young cohort and like, you know, platforms like Facebook might not be appropriate if they're not necessarily going to be the audience on Facebook. Um, but, you know, I think they're like, when you're recruiting like not online there are also lots of people who are going to be excluded so if you've ever tried to recruit um not using like online advertisements it's extremely difficult and you often tend to recruit people who are like fairly close to your kind of like social circle through your own networks and that can also be problematic so kind of there's always going to be uh limitations to your recruitment um that you have to think about so always having in mind who's excluded by the process that i'm using is probably uh, my tip to think about because no matter what technique you use it's possible that there are going to be people who that doesn't reach so perhaps also using multiple channels um, but I'll I'll hand it over to Brady. I was just going to say thinking about what Simon said actually about the kind of algorithmic sorting of messages and how it can produce particular kind of um, echo chambers in the right word but you know it can be shared amongst networks that are quite similar um, on the other hand, social media, especially if you're going to make the decision and have some budget to pay for boosted posts, can be a great opportunity to reach people outside of your network potentially. But even though that's partly true, you can sometimes encounter, um, you know, this effect of people completing surveys or volunteering to participate all the time. So it's like a group of people who are common research participants, I suppose, which is the same issue with large survey panels and kind of longitudinal research as well. So there's a kind of sampling bias, I think, regardless of which way you go, because if you're the kind of person who always clicks on survey links or university ads to volunteer, you're going to get more of those ads. Um, so yeah, recruitment is quite tricky, but I agree with Claire, like we, the most of us, depending on what, you know, our research question is and who we're trying to reach, you know, diverse channels can help mitigate against some of those issues. Um, we have a question from Hannah about whether it's kind of standard practice that researchers in, you know, the, in the internet space have profiles um, that are um, allotted to research or whether they don't. And I, I wonder what Simon thinks about this, especially considering, of, you know, your participation um, as a researcher on the manosphere. I wonder how you sort of um, approach this. Oh, is this the last question from Hannah? Is there a standard practice that researchers... Yeah. Um use like a researcher profile on on the digital oh, that they're studying yeah um i okay so that's a really good question i i don't know if there's a standard practice and i think it depends again on, on the research questions that you've got um so so for example i had the discussions you know about uh, with my supervisor in a, early on you know about ensuring when I when I, I did a lot of observation of the subreddits that I decided that I wanted to research, um, I created a profile, I used a different one to one that I'd ever posted on on Reddit, um, just just for a little bit of, of, of difference, but I never posted on those on those subreddits ever. It was just all observation. Um, some people um, will use a researcher profile to go in and maybe participate, but you then have to give more informed consent around your participation around, you have to declare yourself. I think that's that would be a clear ethical thing if you're doing more than just observing, um, particularly uh, research that goes into private spaces, um, more private spaces ones. You know, the, the communities I looked at on Reddit, uh, you could put in the URL and you could see everything straight away, um, but there are private uh, Reddits, there are private Facebook groups. Um, there are some people who have done research in private Facebook 
Facebook groups uh, where they go in, they talk to the administrators, they say this is what they want to do, the administrators give them permission to then declare themselves to say that I'm here participating doing this research. And I've seen people, you know, I know of people who've done that on the dark web, of people who've done that in really difficult places. So it is feasible, um, but you just have to, and again, it depends on your question, it depends on what you're trying to do, um, but you would always do that probably with a researcher profile, I would, I would, I would hesitate to ever put your private private profile into these spaces because uh, you never know what people can then track you down, um, you know, what, what information, and particularly in the areas that I'm in, you know, harassment is a real thing uh, and it's a real risk. So you've got to do some of those things to, to mitigate from that, but it is also possible to do that while participating. If, if that's what you want to do, it brings up more ethical questions and more difficulties, but it is feasible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from this is this is a question that I think even I've been um, not struggling with, but definitely something that I ask myself in my own research. I'm I'm looking at the internet practices of young men, and mm. I'm sort of following a digital ethnography um, um, approach towards it. And my idea, I, I like you said, um, Simon. I think it depends on the questions that you have, the platforms you're studying, and sort of also the the epistemology that you start off with in terms of what you're what you want how you want to answer your questions yeah. and one of the things that um guided my own um decision making when it came to using my personal profile was that you know if it's a digital ethnography and i'm going to offer a you know i'm looking at um, they're going to my participants are offering me a window into their sort of dis digital life then i'm going to do the same thing back for them so mm. it was it was sort of informed by this feminist ethics of care and yeah that's just but also at the same time kind of weighing the risks of you know safety um as a young woman sort of looking at um you know the internet practices of young men so i think um the the answer to that question is there's definitely no standard practice but yeah. it really depends on what you're what you're looking at um yeah. and you have to be sorry just to yeah. you have to be definitely. also think about the will the amount of you know in some of those cases the amount of risks that you want to take but we think about that with qualitative research too. Are you do you do, are you comfortable going and speaking one on one with someone in an interview? And you know, I know people who have driven to people's houses to do interviews. I've driven to people's houses to do interviews. There's a, there's there's inherent risks with all the work that we do, and it's like the levels that you're willing to take um, and putting in safeguards to to ensure that you've got that. But sometimes the work is worth it. And you know, in most cases, in most research, you'll find that people are pretty good. Uh, and you know, there's there's exceptions to that, and you just have to be wary of those exceptions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, Claire, Alex has a very interesting question for you where, um, you know, asking about trying how to challenge the sort of one dimensional portrayal or, you know, not looking at the embodiment um, or the embodied experiences of, I'm guessing, the, the, the digital, uh, when it's not framed as the central um, point of exploration how do you de how do you negotiate that or how do you how do you frame your research in in ways when you know embodiment is not the um, the main aspect of exploration yeah that's a really good question I think um like some of the uh, the ways that like a lot of the time this comes up with in interviews with participants when they're talking about um the like the way that things that they've experienced or seen or things that they show in interviews, whether it be like a screenshot or a, a video or kind of a conversation we have, um, they will describe, um, provide really rich descriptions of experiences that are really evocative and sensory. And I think it's often um, kind of about your kind of bringing together your kind of theoretical um, orientation and your kind of like methodological approach to really what you see as kind of the empirical um, in your research. So kind of just being, I think, being attuned to the kind of sensory and bodily in your um, research. So a lot of the, I did a really interesting kind of um, Twitter project where I, I did the interviews through kind of Twitter DMs and research participants like sent a lot of like really interesting like pictures and links and like gifts like and all this really interesting stuff that kind of was really evocative and sensory and in that project um, that material really uh, like allowed um, us as researchers to kind of really get a sense of the kind of um, affective and sensory um, dimensions of kind of digital spaces um, and I think like images and videos are also um, like even though they kind of seem representational are often really affective and bodily artifacts. Um, so I think it's often about 
like seeing beyond what we think of as a kind of representational um, object. Um, and also I've done a fair bit of like autoethnographic work, which is about kind of being attuned to how, like to my sensory and bodily experiences in a digital space. Um, so that's a kind of another way that I've, um, that I've done that. Yeah. Um, thank you, Claire. We've got so many questions. I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm, Aisha, Aisha Jahangal, you've raised your hand. So I'm just, um, if you'd like to ask a question, we have time for just one more question. And I'm just going to say that um, on your behalf, I'm going to say that for all those who have got interesting questions for Brady and Claire and Simon, I would definitely invite you to, um, you know, engage with them on Twitter or over email. And yeah, that's, that, uh, yeah, I, I just did that on your behalf. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, Jaha, um, Aisha, uh, yes. Thank you so much. It's been uh, really uh, helpful uh, listening to you all. Um, my area is media and public discourses coming out from war and conflict zones. Um, and I am at this point doing a digital ethnography of how um, extremist militant groups such as the Taliban are using social media. Um, uh, so, in, so I'm also looking at activists, but at, now I understand that I can access activists and I can ask for their uh, consent and I can let them know what I'm doing. But when it comes to observing or monitoring the uh, digital um, behavior or um, consumption of militant organizations, how, I wonder how ethics would play around that because I cannot talk to them or um, I cannot just um, ask, seek for informed consensus of that I'm monitoring you. These are public accounts on Twitter. so. Because I'm, I'm, I'm now going to submit my ethics application, so that's one thing I'm really um, confused about right now. Thank Maybe you. I'll just jump in like, really quick answer, and others might have more detailed responses. But there's definitely a lot of, by the sounds of it, a really strong case for a waiver of consent in your particular situation. I think you know the potential benefits far outweigh any kind of informed consent process with these particular kinds of actors. Yeah, and just just so for example, um, Aisha, I, as I said, researched, um, you know, groups on Reddit and Manosphere, and I, I did not seek consent of those groups to do that. And that was a similar kind of a waiver of consent. I spoke to the ethics committee about, um, about that and said, you know, we, we, you can't go and I wouldn't get consent and you can't go and get it from every, every member of those groups. And I think that there is a clear um, uh, particularly for, for organisations who are seeking to publicise this material into the public space. Um, I think it's, you know, often, and this isn't true for everything on social media, and I want to be really clear about that, but for these kind of groups, I often think about them similar to if they were publishing a book or a, or a newspaper article, that we wouldn't be seeking consent in that case. Now, that's not true for all social media accounts, but in something like this, I think that it's reasonable to think about them in that kind of way. Um, there would be, obviously... Um, uh, there are lots of people who have done this kind of work uh, on on terrorist organisations, and um, you know maybe if it's if you need to consult some of those people who have done that. But I, I think you could easily get a waiver of consent for for observing, you know, Taliban Facebook groups. I don't think that would be a problem. Great, um, thanks, question. Simon. Like yeah, research. absolutely. Um, and and yeah, what what a fantastic topic of research as well. Yeah. And thanks, Simon and Brady, for that. And unconsciously, I mean, I'm I'm aware that we are at time, unfortunately, and I feel like this discussion is so incredible and that it could go on for hours, but all good things must come to an end. And I'm not sure who decided that, but yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so thank you to the panel, uh, to Brady and Claire and Simon for joining us today and giving us so much insight uh, from your experience. Um, Brady has suggested that if you, you know, if you want to talk further about what your questions or your research, please email him and um, so definitely. Um, and thank you to the, the amazing uh, participants who joined us today uh, for this research and for contributing so much, so much to the chat and to the discussion. So um, I'm gonna stop the recording now and I'm, I hope that everyone has a fantastic uh, day and a great weekend ahead.